Spencer, welcome to the show. Happy to hear, hear, be here, Justin. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. You know, I'm, I'm really, really excited to dive into your story. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, what, where you found yourself for 20 plus years. Uh, we're going to get into it. Obviously, look, you wrote the book Manhattan, Manhattan Cult Story, right? Just to kind of give people an idea of where we're going with this conversation. Um, but why don't we start with who is Spencer today? And then we'll break down your whole entire journey and how you got to where you are now. Sure, sure. So um, I am um, uh, a corporate attorney. Um, I practice in New York. Um, I do, you know, litigation. I'm a father of one. I'm divorced. I um, have a dog named Stella. And my favorite pastime is uh, swimming. I became uh, an ocean uh, long distance swimmer. So I'm around Manhattan. And that's kind of my passion. And um, that's where I'm at. Let's talk about that for a second. I did read that in your bio about you being a, a long distance ocean swimmer, including cold water. How does one even get into that? Like, what was the draw for you to, to get into that type of uh, physical activity? Yeah, well, swimming was something I've always done in my life. And um, when I got out of the cult, actually, it was something that I re- uh, discovered as a, something that, that I really like to do. And I found a community there and, um, you know, I just started to swim and a lot of people started, you know, in, in New York, actually, there's a lot of long distance swimmers. So I started with a one mile swim and, you know, I heard about people doing, you know, around Manhattan. So I did the training and, um, you know, I have the aptitude for it. It's very, um, meditative. It's slow. And you'll find that a lot of, uh, you know, uh, long distance open water swimmers, they're older. So this is not like, you know, pounding on pavement or something like that and no huffing and puffing. Um, the cold water swimming started because I attempted to swim um, uh, to Block Island from Montauk. I got halfway there and I just was too cold. Um, so it was recommended that I try, you know, cold water swimming, which means swimming in temperatures that could be down to, you know, 32. And, um, yeah, so, uh, so I, um, started, you know, I, I started, you know, basically I just started in September and stayed in the water until the next summer. <laughs> wow. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So do you, is there any like breathing techniques when it comes to swimming in that type of temperature? Like, cause here's the, the honest truth. Like we go to the Jersey shore for vacation. I'm in Pennsylvania. So we go to the Jersey shore for vacation. It'll be like August and I'm like, water's too cold. And so, so what is that process like? Is there, is there a mental kind of uh, approach to that? You hit the nail on the head. It's all about breathing because you will immediately lose your breathing in cold water. Um, and so it's really about knowing enough that you're, you will recover your breathing in about 60 seconds. So you'll hyperventilate for a while. So it's really, uh, you know, a meditative skill of understanding um, what your body can do and knowing it will survive. Um, yeah. And then after about a minute, you become numb. <laughs> so I'm sure it, it's I'm very, sure. it's very doable. Yeah. 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 So, so anyway, it's a great. No, yeah, no, no, I love I it. Just saying, it's great. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just saying it's a great sport. I really enjoy it. And there's a great community of people who do it and um, happy to meet you sometime in Jersey Shore. Yeah, they, it's a lot warmer down there, at least this time of year. That's the only time I'm potentially getting in the water. But, you know, with that being said, obviously, look, you know, people hear this, right? You you uh, surround yourself with amazing people. You put yourself to a challenge every single day and swim long distance. And you're a successful attorney in New York City, which is one of can be, you know, you can make it in New York. You can make it anywhere. Um, but but you found yourself in a cult. And I'm going to start probably where a lot of the conversation starts when you talk about this with people. I imagine it, you know, my thought process is. How could you find yourself like how do you end up in a cult right like i would think i'd see all the signs i wouldn't get sucked in like and i imagine this is what most of the world is thinking that hasn't been in your shoes like let's talk a little bit about your experience when you joined because you know you saw yourself walking in a room full of people just like you so what what was that moment like when you walked in and, and how did you even find out about this thing yeah it's 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 right on uh because i think uh uh, you know, no one joins a cult, first of all. I mean, I, when I heard about this group, uh, I was invited by um, an acquaintance 
Um, and when he explained that it was a secret group that studied esoterica and some philosophers who I never heard of, I immediately you know, told him I wasn't interested in joining what sounded to me like a cult. Hmm. And, um, you know, uh, he um, convinced me that I should just try to attend one meeting. And um, sure enough, I went to a meeting in, uh, in the loft in Manhattan, and it was a bunch of people who looked just like me, you know, professionals, people in, in suits and, and ties, and, you know, there was nobody chanting, there was no, uh, you know, sacrifices, it looked all pretty normal, albeit fairly dull, and, um, you know, I wasn't inclined to return, frankly, I just, you know, I'm not, I'm very independent, I'm, you know, I'm not spiritually minded, um, I had a really good life, uh, you know, I was working very hard, I was making a good living, I had lots of friends, I really had no reason to join any group at all, or any inclination. Um, I went more out of curiosity. Sure. And, um, you know, I continued, I mean, I can get into that. Do you want me to explain why? Of course, I, yeah, please take us through that. this crazy journey. Yeah, yeah well, because, uh, you know, I think it's important um, for people to understand, um, and I really hope to help people with this and understand a little bit more about how these kinds of groups operate and just really hoaxes and deceptions in general, because we're all susceptible to being uh, ripped off and cheated and, and lied to. And uh, while it's one thing to buy a, you know, a used car and it's a lemon, you know, and being lied to by the used car salesman, it's another thing when, um, um, you're in a relationship um, or in some kind of organization or you've given your money to someone and, you know, you've, uh, they, people have, uh, you know, you, uh, have instilled a sense of trust in you um, and uh, you come to trust them and they offer things that you want or need, even if you don't realize you want or need them, mm -hmm. right, um, because they're good at reading you. Um, it's very easy to be manipulated. And that's a natural thing. I mean, we're all inquisitive. We're generally trustworthy. Um, we, we have wants and desires. And, you know, this group was very sophisticated, extremely, and we could talk more about that when we get to it, but they were highly sophisticated and they knew exactly who they were targeting, which were highly educated, wealthy, young New Yorkers and some in Boston and some in Copenhagen. But mm. what happened to me was I had a personal, I, so back up, I agreed to go to these classes. They were called classes, okay? Um, and the concept was that this was a school of, of ancient knowledge and we would study these old, these philosophers. Fair enough. I told my friend who encouraged me to go that I go for four weeks. One event happened that there's, I don't think I would have ever gone back after the four weeks had um, I not gone through a personal crisis, which is that um, my law firm that I was working for shut down and I lost wow. my job. And, um, you know, uh, I was received such support and encouragement from not only the leaders of the group, but from the 60 other people in the classroom. And so this community, this love, you know, this feeling was, you know, overwhelming. And it wasn't like, you know, if I told my buddies, they would have been like, oh, you know, whatever, or, you know, family, they would have been okay, you know, uh, maybe a little bit supportive, but this was intense in a room of 60 people. And so I, I, I was kind of lured in with that and that made me go longer and, you know, I can get more into it, but that was basically why I continued because of a personal crisis. Yeah. And that's so fascinating. And I imagine that happens with a lot of people, right? They, they join because a buddy of theirs says, Hey, come check this thing out. And they're always like, okay, whatever. Um, and then, you know, they find themselves down the road being like, well, 
well, you're right. I have gone through this or I, you know, my emotions have experienced that. Talk a little bit more about how they were able to kind of manipulate that tough situation for you uh, and keep you coming back. Obviously, I know you mentioned the support and, and I totally get what you're saying, right? I, like if, yeah. if something bad goes wrong in your life, your friends, your loved ones, they go, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, but everything's going to be okay. You'll get another job or right. whatever, right? Like you'll, you'll, you'll see yourself through, which is I'm sure accurate. Um, but, but how did they approach this and, and what was their thing to kind of keep coming you back? Or have you keep coming right. back? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it wasn't just the support and compassion. It was also that they claimed they had tools that would help me, like tools that they had that nobody else had that were, you know, ancient knowledge and they were based upon a philosophy that were contained in, you know, several books written by these two um, philosophers, Gurdjieff and Espensky neither of whom I'd ever heard of despite being a philosophy major. Now, I'm also, you know, uh, intellectually minded, you know, mm -hmm. I like to read and I like to think. And here were tools, supposedly, that could help me. And there were some ideas in these philosophies that, you know, sounded legitimate that might be able to help me um, with what I wanted to do, which was to open up my own law practice, and which I ultimately did. And, um, I, I came to, um, I mean, I think that answers your question, right? Yeah, for sure. For them to give yeah. you those, well, to say that we have these secret tools that nobody else other than the individuals in this room and whoever has gone through this school that you're talking about. Um, and, and look, it sounds amazing, right? Like it sounds like this great opportunity that you stepped into. Now, was this a free school or were they already charging uh -huh. you at this point? Free. Right. So the first month was free. Um, and then it became $300 a month. Um, and over the years, the charges increased. Um, uh, you know, there was this tuition of $300 a month, but then there were add-ons. And, um, you know, I, I figured it out by the end, I was pr probably paying, you know, twice that amount per month, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's a lot of money. Um, but I didn't miss it. Yeah. Um, it totally makes sense. I see exactly what you're saying. It wasn't, it wasn't hurting you financially. And so you just kept going along with it to be like, this makes sense. Hey, I'm getting what I need out of this, this very moment. Cause again, they, I'm sure, I imagine they're manipulating and finding out more and more about you. Right. So obviously there had to have been a moment that it started to change a little bit where, where it went from, okay, this is normal. They're giving me the tools to, whoa, what's going on. Let's talk a little bit about that moment where maybe you started to open your eyes a little bit. Yeah. So um, what, what happens is, what, let, me, let me put it in context, when that moment happened, it was about a year or so in. And by that time, there was a certain amount of dependency and fear and all kinds of emotions involved with the group. The dependency was, well, I felt that my successes in my journey, in my new um, practice were somehow connected with the tools that they had shown me so um and they made you feel this way and they oh, yeah. made you feel that if you left them you would lose that those tools okay so i was i felt dependent and somewhat uh, indebted to them the second thing was if you left the group you would be shunned and ostracized which by the way is a telltale sign of a cult, telltale sign, um, ostracization. And, and yeah. one of the things I've come up with is like sort of this list of nine or so um, hallmarks of a cult. That's one of them. So what happened was by the time they asked me to do something that I thought was weird and uh, imposition, I, was, I felt very dependent upon them and connected. And that imposition was they asked us to recruit other people and spend mm -hmm. a great deal of time, hours and hours and hours a week and our money. Um, and it would, went on for years uh, to bring in new uh, students. And um, it was a very sophisticated method of you know, finding, befriending and secretly vetting them and luring them into your um, circle of trust, and then springing onto them this idea of a group that was very secretive. I mean, that's the whole um, important part is that it was secret. So 
you couldn't just tell anybody about the group. You had to be able to vet and make sure they were trustworthy. Yeah, so it's like it's and, like Fight Club, right? The first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, and that's the second rule too. And it was it's in, it's strictly enforced. And, and that was a um, immediate turnoff for some people. For the others, it was an attraction. Sure, yeah, like I get to be a part of this and I, I don't have to talk about it. You know, and I know that as you read parts of your book and, and you know, the, the, the layout of what you write, you talk about how, you know, you become such great friends with these people, but when you're out in public, you almost like have to pretend that like you don't even know them. Exactly, yeah. Um, we were uh, encouraged to be quote unquote invisible. And if I, you saw somebody on the train or somewhere, you, you know, maybe just a nod, but not, you, you don't say anything. And that uh, happened many times through the years. Wow. wow. Now, when you, when, in the time that you were there, you were there, you were in the cult for how long? 20 plus years? Yeah. 23 years. Yes. Okay. And so during that time, did you see anybody leave and, and how did they, if so, how did they ostr ostracize them and, and kind of try and ruin their life in a sense? Yeah. So um, many, many people left. Um, uh, you know, I think people who uh, many, many people left and everyone was ostracized it was without any kind of um, uh, implication, um, without any kind of hesitation, rather. And um, they were demonized in, in, in class. You know, the leaders would talk about them as, you know, being lost souls. And it's very dangerous for you to talk to them. And it's very bad for them to talk to you. And, um, you know, there would be married couples and one person would leave. And sure enough, um, if the, the other spouse remained in the group, they were encouraged to get divorced from the person who left. And I saw that many, many times. Families broken up. Um, um, let me turn off my... Um, my uh, email so you don't hear those, those sure. blink. Um, I apologize. So, um, you know, families broken up. I mean, children being split from one parent who was no longer in the group. Um, you know, people who worked in businesses. I remember during the 2008 um, financial crisis, one a woman who worked for someone um, was told to do something by the leader, refused to do it, and her boss, who was also in the group, fired her. Oh my gosh. And she, she lost it all. She lost her business. Um, there was a, uh, uh, an individual who um, was a doctor who um, many of his patients were in the group, and he was kicked out, and we were told not to see him anymore. And that hurt his business a lot. So financial, uh, you know, and, and other ways as well. And, and, but other than that, I mean, there was really no, um, you know, uh, other um, repercussions for people when they left. But those are big ones. I those mean, are they pretty didn't big. Yeah, get a divorce. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They didn't kill people and whatnot. But, you know, the other thing is, you know, everybody who leaves, I mean, I'm telling you, I get calls from people who left 20 years ago and they still have scars. You know, people have, you know, PTSD over this, yeah. you know, it, it, people who just were there for a week. Um, there's a lot of shame, you know, for being uh, hoaxed and deceived. And um, who wants to say they were in a cult? I mean, I don't mind. I think it's <laughs> you wrote it's the book. Important. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's great. I mean, I've had nothing but great um, response and, and feel, you know, like I'm doing a service to other people, which you can't do anything better than that, right? For sure. So, yeah, you know, you talk yeah. about, you know, in the book, you talk about mental and sexual and physical abuse and, and forced labor. Talk a little bit about that and how that kind of took place. And was that everybody in the cult? Was it different layers of people? Like, what did that look like? Yeah, so let me write them down because um, each one takes a little bit. So mental, physical, uh, sexual. Yep. Okay. So I would say um, everyone had mental abuse. Uh, there was no, no, um, no one spared of that. And um, the leader, uh, whose name was Sharon Gans, was um, 
an extremely intelligent person who was very good at um, reading people's and finding out what they wanted and, and what they didn't want and what they were afraid of. And the way we met were, was, like I said, twice a week in these group meetings in um, a secret loft in the city. And it would be 60 to 100 people in a room. Um, and Sharon Gans would lead the class with maybe one other person. And people would come in. The format of the class was mostly people would come in and talk about their personal lives and their personal problems. And, um, you know, uh, people spoke about very intimate things. And many times, you know, I, I would say it was like half of the time, Sharon would uh, praise, um, he'd love on people. And, you know, she couldn't, you know, nobody can make you feel better than her. And then you had a classroom full of people who were, yeah, great. You know, you did great and, and, and whatnot, talk, things in your life. But sure. And so then, on, it, then, then that would encourage other people to share openly because they wanted that praise. Exactly. But then Sharon could also make you feel uh, horrible about yourself. And she was very skilled at that. And she could be very abusive and cutting and humiliate people if they didn't, uh, you know, treat her with proper respect. Um, if, you know, she felt, um, you know, really it was, it was at her whim. And, you know, public humiliation in front of your friends, I, I can't tell you how bad that feels. It's just an awful feeling if people have uh, no abusive bosses or other toxic environments. Um, you know, you can always go home from that. This is different because your whole life is this group and to be cut down um, for, uh, you know, the slightest infraction, being late to class, um, uh, um, you know, um, not having done something she asked you to do, being late with tuition, being, um, uh, you know, whatever, whatever rules there were. So mental abuse was heaped on everyone. Physical abuse was very common also in the sense that we were put to physical work throughout the tenure. Um, people were, um, you know, working on very uh, labor intensive projects um that and you know there we're doctors and you know uh, you know we have soft hands you know we're not meant to like you know like i was in montana building log cabins and digging ditches and stuff and wow. you know people were getting hurt um someone almost had his arm chopped off uh there was almost a death uh i remember seeing um you know, uh, we worked throughout the night. I remember seeing, you know, older women standing on ladders late at night, furiously painting to reach some kind of, uh, you know, arbitrary deadline to beat an arbitrary deadline. Um, and then there was this boxing that we did, which I think was reported in the paper the other day in terms of uh, Fight Club. So we had wow. this, uh, we had this, uh, the, the one of the, they wanted us to, um, they wanted the men to learn how to box. The concept being that it builds character and whatnot, and it's a great sport. And it's true. But um, the, the real reason they wanted us to do it was, I think, also to break us down emotionally and humiliate people. Um, it's very hard to box, and it's very hard to be in fights. It's one thing to, you know, box and spar here and there friendly, but to have out and out, um, you know, rough fights with trained people is, you know, a recipe for disaster. So a lot of us, including me, I had a broken nose, a concussion, and, you know, I was told not to get it treated. You know, I was told to tough it out. Um, you know, wow. this is, this is not proper. Um, yeah. They were Real all, quick, really quick. Let's go back. What were you building log cabins for in Montana? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the leader, Sharon Gans, and her husband, whose name is Alex Horn, who's also passed away, they um, had a 120-acre ranch in Montana, and they invited some of the wealthier members of the group to come out uh, in the summer for a couple of weeks at a time and work on their ranch and help build, you know, help build and maintain the property. The property hmm. was built um, literally by six people in a Montana winter um, 
in, you know, nine months, I think they worked, you know, like 20 hour days to build the cabins. But later on, when the group got bigger, she had something like 60 people come out over the summer, throughout the summer. Uh, uh, and we would do this very hard physical work. Um, wow. Yeah, it was an intense period. And that there was a lot of abuse, a lot of physical abuse besides the building. You know, Alex used to beat people up. Um, uh, um, and then I could talk about the sexual abuse. I mean, that really, I saw that in Montana. You know, I saw, you know, women being coerced to, you know, have sex with men. Um, and, and let me explain what, what I mean by the coercion. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't like a, uh, it's, I mean, I think it's rape just the same in my mind. Um, not violent and, and physical violent, but rape just the same. Cause I don't think it's consensual when you're in a cult or in a group and you're brainwashed and the leader tells you, oh, you should have sex with Bill or you should have sex with Johnny. I think that's sexual abuse. 100%. Um, when I saw it, I didn't. I didn't really understand. You know, I thought, oh, this is good for her. Mm. And that would happen with men too. There would be that kind of abuse of men. Um, gay men were encouraged to uh, sleep with and marry straight women. That's abuse wow. for both sides. Um, there were many arranged marriages. I was in one. Mm. Um, Sharon encouraged incest and generally polyamory, which is, you know, just intermarrying people. So um, that was uh, the scope of, of that. Um, it's yeah. just, it's absolutely unbelievable. And like you said, when you're in it, Right. And I'm so glad you're sharing this story because it's 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 an important thing to share with the world because there are so many people that find themselves in these types of situ situations. And when you're in it, it's almost just like, OK, well, this is just this is just part of the process. I'm, I'm doing this as a favor. I'm doing this to help myself. I'm doing this to help the community. And it becomes so much. It's almost like I, I imagine and I'm speaking out of turn because I've never been there, but I imagine it's like being an out of body experience when you look back. Totally. You, you, you really, it is out of body because I look back and I can't believe all this happened, but I can also understand where I was at and where other people are at. I mean, you think you're made to think that these things are in your own best interest. And that's why one person with such power and one person, you know, leading hundreds of people can make these outrageous demands. Um, um, uh, because people are just, uh, you know, uh, duped. Yeah. And uh, afraid. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I did, I, I did a little bit of research and, and now I'm forgetting her name, the leader, Sharon, is it Sharon? Yeah. yeah Sharon, so Sharon, Sharon. She was an, she was an actress or something. Like how did this even like, ha have you done the research to find out where this even started? I know she's now passed at this point about a year plus ago, but right. have you done the research on, on what her thought process was behind all of this. Yeah. So she was an actress in the, in the sixties. Um, uh, you know, she was in avant-garde theater, um, in New York. And then I think she was in one movie, Slaughterhouse five in early seventies. And then she disappeared from acting and, um, she was married with uh, two children and then met a man named Alex Horn. She left her husband and her children moved to San Francisco. She, this was all in New York where she originally was moved to San Francisco. And Alex was already involved in sort of cult um, practices. He um, uh, had um, uh, his own sort of commune cult in San Francisco in the 70s with his previous wife and left her and met Sharon. He was much older than Sharon. And they started this theater company because Alex was a, a playwright. And they started this theater company in San Francisco called the Theater of All Possibilities, that which was really a cult. Um, they forced uh, members to sell tickets to their horrible shows, and um, there was, a, you know, a lot of allegations of abuse. The same thing that they did in New York. And when there was an article about them in the San Francisco Chronicle, they went undercover. They left San Francisco. They came to New York, and they rebranded as 
this esoteric school, but was completely undercover. So when I joined in 1989, they didn't have this thing called the internet. They didn't have this. I couldn't look it up. Yeah. If I want to, which I did, but there was no way to know any of this stuff. Even now, the group continues. Even now, it's almost impossible to find them because they don't say who they are. Yeah. They've changed their name. They, they're very secretive and they still exist. Mm, that's, that, I was going to ask Boston. you that, you know, with, with the two original leaders gone, it has obviously been passed on. Is it passed on to the next generation? Like, do we know who's running it now? Like, that's crazy. Yes. Yes. She, uh, she had these acolytes who followed with her to San Francisco. And when she died, I mean, she had many, many acolytes, but, um, uh, the, there were four who remained and they are still leading the group. And um, there's a lawsuit actually against them um, by some women who are claiming uh, they should have been paid for all of their services. So they, they're, they're in existence. And, um, wow. you know, one of my goals is to hopefully, you know, shut them down. Yeah. Well, so let's, let's talk a little bit about you, you leaving the cult, right? Obviously 23 years after joining, I'm really bad at math. 2012. Um, yeah. is that, that, look at that. I, oh my God, passed the test today, but you know, awesome. 2012, what was, um, what was that like? What happened that made you go, I I'm done with this. Yeah. So it, you know, I was very unhappy for a while, but I was uh, kind of imprisoned by, two things. One, my marriage, um, which although it wasn't a good marriage, I still was committed to it. And I knew that if I left the group, that would end and it would create all kinds of uh, issues that I didn't want to go through. And the other thing was that my business was very much tied in with my membership in the group. Um, So those things kept me in. But what happened was just a series of betrayals by the leaders, um, which and, and uh, be, the, you know, these betrayals were rather deep, um, having to do with my business, my personal life, and other, um, you know, aspects of control that really just, they just, I just felt like these people were not in my corner anymore, and were actually didn't give a crap about me. So mm-hmm. that's what led to me wanting to leave and then a couple of events just, you know, broke the straw, broke the camel's back. And, sure. um, you know, that's what happened. You know, it happened very quick. No, for sure. Which, you know, obviously as you were like, I, I imagine there was a fear there when you were, when you were leaving, you know, the, this situation, how did they kind of ostracize you? Did it hurt your business? Like what, did, what did that, obviously you're no longer married. Was that all part of it? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I married. I got divorced a couple of years before I left, but um, you know my business became solely involved with uh, one um, individual um, in, in the in there, and I was um, counsel for his business. And when that relationship started to sour um, with him, there was less and less of a need for me to be in the group, and I really felt I needed to get out of the group. But once I left the group. Um, I was ostracized and that I was cut off from doing business with that guy. So I lost my entire, my entire law business just went completely overnight. And I was very frightened and, you know, I was in very bad emotional state. I was really having a a nervous breakdown and, you know, very heavy depression and all kinds of, you know, problems that needed medical help, which I eventually did get, but I lost, you know, all of my, um, my business and I had to rebuild. So there was a lot of fear. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't even imagine. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, what are some of the signs people should be aware of if they're invited to these meetings and all the stuff, like, what are some of the, like, what are some of the telltale signs that like, Hey, this could be something different than what they're saying it is. Yeah. Okay. So right out, right out. I'll just say this, like for cult, it's very specific you know, but I do want to talk about hoaxes in general, you know, people who are deceived, you know, because there's, there's, there's a common element. I mean, even people like who put money in Madoff, right? Yeah. I mean, he was like a cult leader or Theranos, you know, that story, the, uh, mm-hmm. 
uh, that story in San Francisco. I mean, those people that was they almost had, were like cult leaders in their own way. They were able to, you know, um, um, convince very intelligent people um, to, you know, ignore common sense and follow an emotional belief that was frankly usually too good to be true i mean theranos the concept that you could you know tell you know make great uh, strides and understand people's you know diseases in a pinprick of blood is just you know any scientist will tell you that that just doesn't exist yeah. but when you had a lot of people behind that you know, and people wanted to make money and you want to be the next big thing. And, you know, that's when you have to stop think you have to start applying common sense and rationality to it. So I would say the first thing is when you're invited, you know, the telltale signs of a, of a cult is a charismatic leader. Um, if people are putting this person on a pedestal, saying they're the greatest thing or the smartest thing, that's a problem. If the group ostracizes people, that's a problem. If there's high demands made on people um, uh, and promises of, of, of future uh, improvements without seeing anything you know, there. I think that's, that's a, a cultish. Um, uh, this sort of mania, if you see people you know, are very uh, enthusiastic, over enthusiastic about things, you, know, yeah. you, you just feel it, you know, you know it's cultish and- um, sure. It's also if you're in a vulnerable place. I mean, if you're depressed or lonely or you've had a, a life crisis, that's a time when you might be susceptible to it. Mm. And um, if you know people who are in cults, I mean, that's a whole other thing. If you want me to talk about that briefly, I could. Yeah, you know, I, I would. I would love to. I mean, I don't know anybody, but that I that I'm aware of at least. Um, but I right. imagine right. people have family members who who have and have turned their backs on them. You know all you know, all the stuff in between. So is there a way from the outside to approach people on the inside and be like, Hey, open your eyes. Yeah. I think it. I think it takes a lot of patience and persistence and love and compassion. I think the hard, you know, uh, pushing someone, uh, it doesn't work. Coercing someone doesn't work. Most people who are in cults are brainwashed and very gaslighted into, you know, their beliefs. And they're also told that people outside are there to hurt them. So you'll immediately find, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of pushback. But I think if you prove them wrong, that you can be loving and listening to them and, you know, maybe let them sort of talk you into it and then, you know, just be really rational and patient, you can talk to people about it. Yeah, for sure. So it's so funny, I, you know, as I watch these documentaries and I'm curious, like I always wonder, like, we, like my, my fiance and I just watched the one about the FLDS, right, which is very cult, like very similar to some of the things you were saying, like the physical labor and the arranged marriages. And obviously that's based around religion. But, right. we, you know, we, we watched this documentary and, I'm, and the whole time I'm thinking like they have to like sneak away together, two or five of them and, and like talk about like, is this weird? Like what's like, why are we here? Did, did that ever happen? Uh, yeah, it did. It did. There was one time where um, we were very upset by something that Sharon did. And there were a lot of people got very, very angry and we plotted to leave. And um, there was probably about 20 of us and uh, we said we got to go. And then I think at the end of it, only like a third of us actually left and the rest stayed. Um, wow. Because, you know, the power was so strong and Sharon reached out to us and convinced us it was a good thing for us to stay and that the people who were plotting were, you know, were bad. So wow. it's really hard. Yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I, I can't, I can't even imagine one more thing, you know, to, yeah. to talk about here before we get yeah. before we wrap up, you know, yeah, obviously, this whole thing costs a lot of money. And, you know, I don't well, what, what, let's talk about this. What was the total number of members? Ah. Uh. There were a few hundred at a time. Okay. Um, if you want to know how much she was pulling in, um, she was pulling in uh, in excess of a million a year in cash. People paid cash. Um, and, you know, I, I do not believe she was paying her taxes. 
I, I imagine, I imagine not. Cause you know, you think about like this big ranch out in Montana and, you know, building things on top of that. And, you know, there's gotta be a ton of money now. And I imagine there's some other stuff that they did to get lump sums at certain times from people and, and stuff like that. Am I wrong by saying that? Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. That happened all the time. So in the ordinary course, there was just millions, but a year just, but people bought her an $8 million apartment at the condo. What? Uh, at the plaza she lived in an eight million dollar apartment overlooking central park wow wow and just the members the members just bought it yeah she asked certain very wealthy people to do that and they did um uh she had cars she had access to a private plane um when she didn't have access to the private plane she got tickets bought for her she had chauffeurs she had doctors she had um massage uh she had you know people giving her luxury items all the time wow. um i was her chauffeur for a while that is just so crazy i mean i can't even imagine you know finding yourself there man but but obviously you know kudos to you for seeing the, the who you truly are and being able to step away from that i think that's beyond powerful and i hope people read this book and hear your message and they go, hey, I, you know, I need to, and number one, if they're not in that situation yet, to be aware of that there are more and more every single day people trying to do this type of thing, whether it be a small Ponzi scheme or something massive like this, like you have to be super aware. So, you know, thank you so much for, for obviously sharing that information, but let's get to the important stuff before I ask you the final question that I ask everybody. How, where do people go to okay. get the book? What's all the good information? Oh, sure. So you can get it at your favorite local bookstore. Um, you can get it uh, at any um, um, uh, online um, retailer, your favorite one, and um, it's on sale right now. And, you know, I love it. it. Uh, look, listen, if you're listening to this episode, go get the, go get the book. I mean, uh, it's absolutely fascinating to to hear the stories and see it unfold and, and, you know, in, in real time through your life, it's absolutely amazing. So like I said, I wrap up every single interview with the same question. The show is called the growth now movement. So that question is in your life and everything that you've been through, what has been your biggest moment of growth? The biggest moment of growth was when I realized that freedom exists in the mind and that no one can control your mind except, you know, uh, yourself. Um, and the, the ordeal I went through was the ultimate uh, destruction of freedom because it was a mind control. But once I realized that I can control my mind and that's the best freedom, you know, that's the one thing I can uh, always hold on to. I love it. Spencer, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and, and sharing the important message for people that need to hear this, you know, potentially as they're going through certain things. So guys, make sure you go get the book. This has to end up on Netflix at some point. I'm not saying you're having that conversation, but you should be having that conversation. Uh, but thank you so much, Spencer, for your time. Thank you so much, Justin. A lot of fun.